My name is Vivian Blewett. I am a visual artist based here in Kansas City, Missouri. When I am channeling this work, I think of the concept of injustice more than I think of the concept of justice when I'm creating. The things that move me to create are things that I have read or seen that literally move me to work. They make me feel like there's something I have to do because people aren't getting it. And I used to question why is it moving me as much as it does. And I don't question why I'm moved anymore. When I am moved, I work. I just start the work because I'm moved. I start the work because I feel it, because it's something that doesn't go away. I can't stop thinking about it. Every time I think of something, it potentially moves me to tears in a way. And I just don't believe that saying things verbally always gets the point across. And I do think that having conversation, the same conversations, over and over and over, it's exhausting. I have had many conversations of the same tune many different times, and it becomes exhausting to keep saying the same thing or even try to convince someone to understand what you're trying to say, right? But if I paint it, I don't have to say it. If I paint it, and you see it, that conversation is no longer between me and you. The conversation is between you and you. You see the art, you have that conversation with yourself. So I started working on the Childhood Daydream series from the very beginning, from like 2017, 2018 is when I started painting pictures of these children who are at rest, they are at peace, they are either sitting with themselves or they are sitting with other children. For me as an artist working through the things that I have to work through, I don't always get it in the beginning. I don't always know why. Why does it bring me peace to see these children at peace? until I have to do that hard, hard work of sitting with myself and asking myself those questions. What is it about this work? Why do you keep creating these things? What is this doing for you? What is this saying to you? And 100% transparency, it really was about the lack of peace that I felt when I was a kid. To me, the relationship between daydreaming and freedom is just the ability to be. When you are not free, you can't just sit in rest. When you're not free, the only thing that a person can imagine when they're not free is what to do to become that, right? There is absolutely nothing in the world more powerful than a mentally free person. And people who don't want you to be mentally free because they were able to use their imagination to figure out ways to keep you in bondage, they are afraid of people who are mentally free. We live, those, we live in those people's imaginations every day. Somebody thought of the prison system. Somebody thought of police. These things all started from somebody's imagination and now someone's freedom to think and imagine has become someone else's prison, has become someone else's trap. Once you know it, you can't unknow it. Once I've already said it and you have heard it, you can't pretend that no one has said it because it's just, it's a seed. I, I don't, I'm not interested in beating people over the head with any information. 
But when the seed is planted, you can't pretend that you never heard it. So one piece that I created that I allow people to have their space to view before I jump in to have any type of conversation is a piece of work that I created in 2019 called After the Smoke Clears. It is the response, my response to the story of Mary Turner. The story of Mary Turner starts in 1918 in Georgia and in the town that she and her husband lived in, there was a murder of a plantation owner that was a white man. When this white man was killed, Mary Turner's husband, along with several other people, were accused of having something to do with the murder of the man. Because of the accusations, Mary Turner's husband was lynched. There was word that there were a group of people gathering at Mary Turner's home and a lynch mob got word that there were a group of people gathering at Mary Turner's home to discuss the events that were happening. They went to Mary Turner's home and when they arrived, Mary Turner was still angry. Well, the lynch mob of course did not take very well to this young black girl standing up for her husband in the way that she did in front of the people that she was doing it in front of. And in essence, they took Mary Turner to a bridge and hung her upside down. They set Mary Turner on fire. And Mary Turner is eight months pregnant. They uh, actually shot her and then they cut Mary Turner's baby from her belly. When Mary Turner's baby hit the ground, he whimpered. And there was someone from the audience that came up and stomped on Mary Turner's baby on the ground. When I read this story of Mary Turner, it moved me like nothing else has ever moved me in my life. And I'm sure that's because I had just had a baby myself. My son was born in December of 2018. And this story I was exposed to in like February of 2019. So I saw myself in Mary Turner. I felt Mary Turner. I felt that baby. I felt her husband being married for almost 11 years myself, just feeling what she would have been feeling, the anger of her husband being murdered, and now I am being lynched for being angry. It infuriated me. It pissed me off like nothing else I have ever imagined. And I did not know what I was going to create. I didn't know how it was gonna turn out. I just knew that one of, the, one of the things that I kept thinking to myself is, what did the children think? I know that nobody said, oh gosh, this happened to this woman and her baby. Let's hurry up and scoop this up and whisk them away so nobody sees what we've done. I know they left her out there. They left Mary Turner and her baby out there so people can see because they wanted people to be afraid. They wanted people to see what is gonna happen to you when you talk back to me the way that she did. I don't care if you're pregnant. You being a woman won't save you. You being pregnant won't save you. You being unborn will not save you. I needed to make sure that people have heard this story. And I still want to know what did the children think? I honestly, I, I never thought of my work as being provocative, but I'm, it, it, it can be, it can be provocative. And when, when I think of it, I think of a granny or someone important to a person, right? When someone important to a person has something they need to say because they've said it soft, they've said it kind, they've said it slow, 
and the message isn't getting there. And now it's going to come out as raw as it can come out. And the way you take it is exactly the way that you take it. But I'm going to say it just like this. That's what I think of when I think of something being provocative or even my work being provocative. And being that I do believe that there are some things that you have to sit with yourself with, because you have to sit with yourself with it, it could be yourself saying, what is this? You get to ask yourself, why am I offended? Why am I put off by this? And then you have to explore that within yourself. You don't ever have to tell me. You don't ever have to share that but it does force you to have to deal with it within yourself. And until we all have those conversations about anything in this world that is oppressive to someone else, none of us are ever gonna be free.